is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Shinise Omara in Sussex, trying to understand quantum computing. And I'm Guy Henderson in northern Germany, where trials are underway on a system to power and charge electric hybrid trucks as they're moving. When it comes to describing the universe, there's the physics of the very large, of stars, of planets and galaxies and their gravitational relationships. And then there's the physics of the very small, known as quantum physics or quantum mechanics. So before we do our next story on quantum computers, we need to do a little primer. But I warn you, things are gonna get really weird. According to quantum physics, things can be in two different places at the same time. This phenomenon is called superposition and can actually be observed in the laboratory where single atoms or subatomic particles can be shown to be in two separate places at once. For more than 100 years, Einstein and other physicists have been trying to disprove quantum physics because, well, it's just too weird. It simply doesn't agree with what we can see and experience. Einstein called it spooky. Professor Winfred Hensinger is a scientist who embraces this quantum weirdness, asking instead, how can we use these strange properties of the universe? So what was your inspiration for getting into quantum physics? So it all started with a theoretical physicist named Jared Milburn, who had this theory that he could make an atom move forward and backward simultaneously. So that is a possibility in quantum physics. And so what we did is we prepared an experiment, we prepared individual atoms, and we made them move both forward and backward simultaneously. But that's just so counterintuitive, so weird. Am I just not getting it, or is this really difficult to understand? It is counterintuitive because we cannot see these things in the way we can prepare them in the experiment. And in order to understand something, you have to relate that to your personal background. And quantum physics doesn't really happen on a macroscopic scale. You can only observe it really well on a very small scale, on the scales of individual atoms. Currently, the most challenging use of the quantum properties of the universe is in the building of quantum computers. So the way our conventional computers become faster and add more and more transistors into the microchip, however, as components, transistors, are becoming smaller and smaller, it becomes more and more difficult to shrink them further. And that's when conventional computers can't really become much faster anymore. So physicists have been scratching their brains for a hundred years on quantum theory. Are you now applying this weirdness to build these computers? Quantum computers are entirely different technology. There's nothing like conventional computers. They're relying on the strange phenomena of, of quantum physics. Rather than just looking at these phenomena, we try to tame them in order to build a machine that is now capable of solving certain problems where even the fastest supercomputer in the world would take billions of years to calculate. That's a whole class of problems that contain many unknown variables, such as cancer treatments, forecasting weather and climate change, online security, both for generating security and breaking encryptions, optimizing traffic flows, predicting financial markets, and even gaming. So what's the difference between conventional computing and quantum computing? So quantum computers make use of quantum physics, and as such, rather than coding information as a string of zeros and ones, as classical bits, they encode the information as a string as of quantum bits. And a quantum bit can be zero and one at the same time. So what does that mean? Imagine you have the world's worst memory stick, a memory stick with only two bits, right? So imagine, for example, you write zero, one into your memory stick. Well, your memory stick is full, it's, it's done. Now imagine you have a quantum memory stick with two bits instead. 
in two quantum bits, I can simultaneously write in two quantum bits 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and that all at the same time. Now, that doesn't really sound that impressive. So imagine, for example, you have a memory stick with 100 bits. I can write in one 100-bit number into my memory stick. But in a quantum memory stick, so if I have 100 quantum bits, now that's the number of different numbers I can encode into this quantum memory stick. So you can see how massively large the number of different numbers is I can encode into these just 100 quantum bits. This stuff isn't easy to understand, so let me explain it another way. Imagine that 100 classical bits was enough to encode this book. Well then, 100 quantum bits would be enough to encode this many books at the same time. So you see, quantum computing really could take us into a whole new realm of computation. Here I've got one of the, the voltages that you can control, and if you increase it, you can see that the ions are pushed to the right. And now if I decrease it, you can see the ions are pushed to the left. Oh, wow, so just like in that game of Pac-Man, exactly, you're yeah. able <laughs> to move ions around. Yeah, exactly. CGTN Europe. There is no more they, or you, or me. In today's economic landscape, there is only we. An interconnected world of business, trade, and investment. Daily coverage told simply, with insight and new perspectives. Global business. We've got the world covered. There's a revolution going on in the auto industry. Cars are rapidly going electric as battery technology advances. The same can't be said for trucks. There is no battery efficient enough to power one of these effectively. So heavy goods vehicles now account for more than a quarter of all transport CO2 emissions in Europe, 6% of the continent's total. And that share is increasing. And yet we rely on them because more than 70% of all goods traded in Europe are transported by road. So I've come to this test track in northern Germany to look at a system to power and charge hybrid electric trucks as they move in an effort to slash greenhouse gas emissions. This is Groß Dorn, a remote nature reserve also housing one of Germany's largest solar farms during the Cold War, the continent's largest military airfield. Not the most obvious place for German industrial powerhouse Siemens to set up shop. So this shelter, which was once used to house Soviet-era nuclear bombers, is now the field test office for something called the E-Highway. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Guy Henderson. Hasso Grunjes. How nice are you? meeting you and welcome to our test facility. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is part of the E-Highway system. 
It's actually the key component. Okay. Um, because this device, which we call the pantograph, mm -hmm. the uh, connecting device, that allows this truck to contact the contact wire while driving and providing the truck with electric energy. And that's um, basically the key innovation which we have in this system. The pantograph automatically detects a contact line installed along a highway and connects to it. The catenary system, as it's called, is powered by substations put in along the route. When it's hooked up, it powers the truck and charges its battery as it moves. If the truck breaks, the energy generated can even feed back into the grid. When you think of hybrid, you automatically think battery combustion, but that's not actually the case. It doesn't have to. Hybrid okay. is open to, to whatever type of hybrid you okay. want. So and even as the technology advances, say in fuel cell technology, yes. this would still be a relevant yes. technology. You, okay. Because of your, yeah, the, the idea is basically that you, you can combine it with all these technologies. And that's important because the, um, if you look at the infrastructure, many people think, okay, this is um, rail electrification infrastructure. We had this for more than 100 years. Um, can't we come up with something better at the mm -hmm. moment? Mm -hmm. I think no, because this is something which provides, based on mature technology, the option to decarbonize uh, the transport mm -hmm. um, sector, mm -hmm. the road freight transport sector mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. by not excluding the other technologies in the future. And I think that's really important with this technology. Okay. I think it's time for a test drive. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Robert. So let me introduce you to our okay, driver. Robert. Veteran long haul driver Robert Albrecht takes over from here and prepares to put the pantograph through its paces. It's on. Even though it's silent. Yes, very silent. Yeah. Okay, we got it. We got it. Okay. Yeah. And now, so is it now? Okay. Okay. I can. I have the uh, gear fencing, I have the lane. It's, uh, you have, must have it. And then you can drop this button. Okay, so we see it going up there. Okay, there it is. Dump. Connected. Perfect. Okay. And now we drive electric. Okay. And you can and see it. Charge the batteries. And can you see it charging? It shows yes, you. Yes, this okay. is a charge. Das Ladebild. 10%. It's already gone up 1%. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, holding on. Now Robert's going to step it up a level. Powerfully. Yeah, it is powerful, yeah. Follow me. Yes, if, if you can. <laughs> OK, so we're going 52 kilometers an hour. And we're now going to put on the gas. So when we. So as we turn out, the pantograph comes automatically down. That's just built into the system. Very quickly passing Gregor, the other driver, and then we swerve back in when we're safe to do so. And so it's at this point you can only put the system back up manually, but you just push a button. That's simple. Simple as that. <laughs> so we've seen this being tested. How soon until we see these on the roads in Germany and other parts of Europe? How practical? How near are we to this being a reality? Well, the the real good point about this is that this is based on very mature technology, railway electrification that has been around for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of experience with this technology, yeah. and that helps us, of course, also to roll this out on a bigger scale. What does the future look like for these? Is this going to be connecting Europe to Asia, or are we talking about just small veins off the major arteries? Where's this, where's this going in your wildest dreams? <laughs> My wildest <laughs> dreams? Um, I see the rollout of the system very similar to the rollout of rail electrification. You could look into shuttle applications for trucks mm -hmm. on the main roads in Germany, but of course also then going beyond. 
And um, the interesting aspect is that the system has to been looked into in very much detail in different studies. One study was, by, for example, performed by the BDI, which is the German Association of Industries, mm -hmm. and they looked into that searching for the solution which is most economical and ecological mm -hmm. to be applied in a reasonable time in order to achieve the targets we have with the climate. Mm -hmm. They found out that this system is actually the most economic investment you can have in terms of decarbonizing road freight transport. And they did this on the basis of Germany only. But they also said that as soon as this expands beyond the borders of Germany, then this will become even more economical. So we've now seen the pantograph system being tested in the field. We're now going to head back to a lab in Berlin and look at the technology behind it. Good morning. How hey, are you? Guy. Nice very to good you. to meet you. Thank you good very much for your time. Head of Siemens Mobility, Michael Peter, spends his days looking into the future. And he sees e-highways one day serving as automated arteries between smart cities. If you had to just recharge one hour every 10 hours, you would have to take 10% of the trucks and put them on a parking lot just to charge them. I mean, this would be a huge logistical effort. So, so to use the catenary line and possibly have hybrid uh, solutions where you, you can at the same time charge the battery. So when, when, when the, the catenary line finishes, you can drive into the city center clean and you could also have a, um, a still a combustion engine on, on board because the electrical drives are very small, would be indeed a huge step forward. So you would see this as the future or a future? For road I transport. think everything is a future nowadays. Yeah. I think everybody okay. has to contribute. Yeah. Cars have to contribute to be cleaner, uh, trucks have to do so, yeah. and, and the trains also. So, Bastian, this is the pantograph. This is it. This is the key to the e-highway. Exactly. OK. And we have one of the project lead here, Bastian Blasso, and his team have spent years adapting a technology originally designed for trains. For example, by adding a second contact point to ground the electricity because, of course, a truck has rubber wheels and installing extra sensors. And, of course, those lines can also move because think of wind uh, pushing on these wires and think of a bridge that might be passed under without uh, interrupting the system. So I see it moving around there. Exactly. And that is simulating basically road surface movement. This is a key, this is a key feature. OK, in very basic terms mm -hmm. here. But you hit a pothole. It's going to move faster than that. It's going to go. It's going to be a jolt, isn't it? So does it? Does the pantograph realistically? It's going to lose contact for a moment when that happens. That depends on other um, um, infrastructure within the truck. And does that matter? You know, if it does lose contact. Not for really. Yeah. It does not really matter because there's of course other electromechanical stuff that even if there's a short interruption, wouldn't really um, disrupt the um, power connection to okay. the truck. Well, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, there, is there a way we can kind of hone in on that sensor technology? Because it seems to me like it's so central to how this system works. Uh, it's, it's central, but not only the, uh, s uh, the sensors. Also, of course, the uh, algorithms that are running in the system itself okay. are very crucial. Okay. Uh, so sensors by themselves are stupid, so to say, if they don't know what to do with the data. Alarm bells are ringing over road freight transport's contribution to climate change. The e-highway may not be the answer. It may well be one of them.
How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference. Two leading technologies have emerged in the race to create a quantum computer. One uses the quantum phenomenon known as superconductivity. The major drawback for this technique is that the quantum computer would need to be cooled to what's known as absolute zero or minus 273 degrees Celsius. Professor Hensinger and his team are working on what's known as the trapped ion technique, where each quantum bit is represented by a charged atom also known as an ion. But for the quantum superposition effect to work, allowing the trapped ions to represent zero and one at the same time, the ions cannot come into contact with any other matter. This is a full-scale quantum computer. So let's start here, the most important gadget, which is the vacuum system. It produces a vacuum which is much better than the vacuum in outer space. So if you step out of a space shuttle, you have a lot more air to breathe, than in, if you were to be inside oh, wow. one of these vacuum systems. So have a look at this black tube and where it ends, just at a window attached to the vacuum system. Behind this window is where the microchip sits. This microchip emits electric fields, which now allow us to hold individual atoms just above the surface of this microchip. Now, so really allowing that control yeah. of the ion. Absolutely. So the ion is a quantum bit. And so this device allows us to hold these quantum bits and to shield them from the environment. The way this quantum computer operates is a little bit like a game of Pac-Man, where each atom levitates and moves across the surface of this microchip, then meets a second or third or fourth atom and undergoes logical computations, so logical gates we call them. A sequence, a series of many logical gates give now rise to an algorithm which then allows us to solve a really, really difficult problem. What you see here is a laser. This laser is used to cool ions close to absolute zero to minus 273 degrees Celsius. And so you can use one laser beam to cool all the ions simultaneously inside your quantum computer. It's counterintuitive because usually lasers are used to burn things. That's right, that's How right. How are they used to cool things? So, but here we use a laser beam and we point that laser beam onto a moving ion. And now as the ion approaches this laser beam, it absorbs light. And you can think of light as having some kind of momentum. So as the atom moves towards the laser beam and it absorbs light, it gets little kicks from all the light being absorbed. And that slows the atom down. And this slowing down process corresponds to cooling the atom to a really low temperature. So if something is fast, it's hot. If something is very cold, stationary. And once they're entirely still, we use them to execute computations. Now, imagine you'd have a billion ions. Imagine if you needed laser beams to execute logical operations. It's a lot of lasers. Then you need a lot of lasers. You need hundreds of thousands of millions of lasers like this. Imagine how many optical elements you'd need to achieve that. 
And one of the things we invented here at Sussex is a new technique to execute quantum gates making use of microwaves rather than laser beams. Learning to control billions of ions starts with learning to control just two, or two quantum bits. So here you can see two individually trapped atoms where we have electrodes that are generating electrical currents, electrical fields, and these fields are confining the two ions in space. And so I'm just working with two ions, two qubits, and doing experiments on those. Okay, so there's two bright white lights there? Exactly. I'm shining a laser on them, they absorb it, and then they de-excite and they emit light. So what you're seeing is a, a sort of representation of both ions in space. So this is happening in the big metallic chunk of a vacuum system. So can you actually control ions using your mass? You can. So as I said, the ions are themselves confined in space using electrical potentials from electrodes. And you can imagine that if you increase one of these potentials by increasing the voltage put on the electrode, you'll effectively be moving the ion, pushing it one way or pushing it the other way. Here I've got one of the, the voltages that you can control. And if you increase it, you can see that the ions are pushed to the right. And now if I decrease it, you can see the ions are pushed to the left. Wow, so just like in that game of Pac-Man, exactly, you're yeah. able <laughs> to move ions around. Yeah, exactly. It's incredible. OK, so you're trying to get things just right for just two ions. Exactly, and once, once we can say that things are, are perfect the way they are for two ions, then we can apply that to the bigger picture to other experiments we have in the lab for a greater number of ions. So this is a very special machine. So what you see here is a device that combines aspects of all the prototypes you have seen in the laboratory next door. This is a very small scale practical quantum computer that illustrates and demonstrates one of the critical features of quantum computing in general, and that's the idea of modularity. So in the other lab, you were looking at two qubits, whereas with this setup, you're actually adding lots of two qubits together. That's right, so in this device, we really manipulate a large number of individual qubits. We transport them, we shuffle them around on site, these microchips. Now, this machine is now on the verge of operating. You can see inside two distinct quantum computing modules, and we've developed a way of making quantum computing microchips that allow us to transport individual trapped ions from one quantum computing module to another quantum computing module. This is going to be a really big breakthrough and, and tremendously simplifies the engineering required to build realistic quantum computers. So I'm never ever going to have a quantum desktop, right? No, absolutely not, unless you have a very, very big desk. <laughs> <laughs> so quantum computers are going to be very, very large. And they have to be large because in order to control these quantum effects, you need to go out of your way to build technology capable of manipulating individual atoms. So none of them is going to be, be very small or very easy to use, but it's going to be unbelievably powerful. And this is what quantum computers are really all about, allowing us to solve problems you could never even dream about solving before. So why are brain tumors so hard to treat? I don't really think we know all the answers. There are two obvious things. The first thing is that they're rare and therefore we don't get that many examples of them. But the second thing is the brain is a protected structure. So it's obviously protected by the skull, so it's difficult to get tissue. But even within the skull, the brain is insulated from the rest of the world by something we call the blood-brain barrier. And so actually most of the chemotherapy drugs that we give that might work for breast or lung or colorectal cancer just don't get into the brain. Throughout the body, there are small gaps between the cells which line the interior of blood vessels. These gaps allow nutrients, water and gases to pass from the blood to the surrounding tissues. But in the brain, these cells are closer together, even overlapping, forming tight junctions which allow only small molecules to pass into the brain tissue, keeping out pathogens and toxins. 